everybody it's christian buckley doing another mvp buzz chat and i'm talking today with alan hello hey christian good to meet you and good to talk to you thanks for having me well alan for folks that don't know you where are you who are you where are you what do you do well who am i who am i that you know lame is right let's uh, let's start singing the song um i am a mvp in the biz app space i've been around here doing this since version one uh, i spent uh, more than well, 15 years deploying CRM and, and ERP on the Dynamics product line. And then I joined Microsoft and spent about seven years over at Microsoft before leaving and coming to own company where I transitioned my career. I, I turned and all the features were getting so rich that I decided to switch gears and, and uh, focus just on data. So that's me in a nutshell. I, I have touched around a thousand deployments in the Dynamics space over time. And uh, I have learned quite a few lessons along the way. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Uh, we were talking about before we started recording. I mean, there's a lot happening in the data space. And uh, certainly, I, I think, I mean, there, there's waves where people are interested, uh, you know, in and around, like, what's going on in data on the back end. I mean, we saw that with, like, move to collaboration platforms, uh, you know, certainly saw that with uh, um, more increased focus around search specifically, you had then the movement towards the cloud and throughout all of those things, you saw dramatic drop in the cost of storage, which meant that companies were saving everything, anything and everything. We might use it later, we don't know how, but we've got that data. And so that's, you know, uh, so w how do you how do you play in that space? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. It kind of goes back for me. It goes back to the story. Of, you know, you know, have, us having been through like the throes of this this digital revolution that that the world lives in, right? If you take yourself back and you look at that transition from megabytes to gigabytes, you know, the world that we lived in, it was not so painful. It was it was scary and cool, but transitioning our applications and our data loads and our warehouses, you know, of, of what was, wasn't so hard to go megabytes to gigabytes. Gigabytes to terabytes was a whole different story. So we went through a lot of pain trying to optimize and find queries that could go at the terabyte level and, and all of these things and, and, you know, compression on storage devices, the whole nine yards. That's when we had to start like getting you know, sit tall in our chairs, get serious. Well, you know, terabytes to petabytes, we haven't even really gotten comfortable there yet. And all of a sudden, there's the zettabyte concept, which for those of you who aren't aware, a zettabyte is one billion terabytes, which is frightening. You know, we, we don't know what our application space is even going to look like working in a zettabyte scale world. So, you know, where I'm focused right now is really evangelizing thought patterns around being efficient with our data and understanding, like, you know, me specifically and my company is backup and recovery. Backing up is easy, but again, looking at all that storage. And then recovery, do you want to recover the whole thing and throw the baby out with the bathwater? Or do you want to be laser precise? And, you know, how much time do you spend doing one versus the other? So it's become a great conversation and it just gets better and better because of this world of AI and, and you know, all this additional data that we're dealing with. It's funny having conversations with people that don't understand what happens in the background. It's like, well, it's just out in the cloud. It's like, no, it's sitting on servers somewhere. You have to <laughs> still access it, performance of that. I mean, I have conversations. I mean, you know, going back to my time at Microsoft, um, I remember having a uh, customer number two in uh, what is now, you know, Office 365. Um, and, you know, everybody knows, remembers Energizer as the number one customer. Um, I had customer number two and having uh, the questions around it, uh, around what is the, um, you know, the, the backup model, like give us data around it. And what is the, uh, you know, uh, when are we back online? What is that, 
uh, uh, you know, the service recovery, like all of that. And none of that was documented. And so I actually sat with two of our engineers and wrote out the initial document kind of outlining what that looked like. Uh, and, and so I, I think more and more organizations, like, again, we live in this luxury of all th this data, but it so reminds me of those early days of when I worked in the data warehousing. It's like, okay, what specifically do you need? And then yeah. go and build a much higher, faster performing, you know, data mart that would, you know, with limited subset of that data to give them what they need in a responsive way. Well, 1990s responsive versus today. <laughs> um, hey, the 90s were all right. We had grunge music back then. <laughs> well, hey, I was not a fan of the grunge though. So I'm, I'm an <laughs> 80s new wave guy. So, but uh, no, but it, it, it's, uh, we're in some respects, we're back to that place. It feels like some of the same conversations, although it's got a different spin on it. It's like, well, now go and create a focused, uh, uh, you know, co-pilot around this specific data set on this SharePoint site so that yeah. it's, it's back to that old model, build that data yeah. mark, build that focused subset of data, and then build views into that. Yeah. And, and I mean, we're, we're lucky that we have, you know, great technology companies out there like NVIDIA and Microsoft that are, you know, creating this compute mechanism for us to do all of this heavy compute, but it's scalar. And, you know, there will be a point when the nanotechnology can't keep up with uh, the size and the scope of the data storage mechanisms. Um, so it, it's really interesting to kind of see how that is, it is, it's running as top speed towards the edge of a cliff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, just, did did, uh, did the founder of, uh, of OpenAI, did he get his three or four trillion or whatever he asked for to create his... <laughs> future company to build the next gen of the internet or whatever he was doing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know him and Elon, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I, I, it's, it's always fun talking about this stuff. Like we're, we're running into, um, you know, the limitations where for a long time, it felt like, Hey, we've got room to grow within the space and the speed of technology, everything, you know, continues at that pace. But we're hitting some walls uh, around yeah. what can be done. So it goes back to your point. Like then, then you have to be more thoughtful and plan out what are we really trying to do and what do we need for this? Yeah. And, and, and the thing that the conversation I have most frequently with my largest enterprise customers is that, you know, when the size and the, and the, the, the scope and the magnitude of the data grows, which we all, you know, like I said, we're all expecting that to be an exponential growth. Well, inherently along with that comes growth of risk, right? When your your surface area increases, your risk area increases. And so whether it be surface area and raw storage or whether it be surface area across more apps in a, in a portfolio, um, integrations, power automate flows, whatever they may be, reports and, and in analytics, whatever that surface area is, as the data grows, that's gonna grow too. And therein lies your risk because the risk will be exponential too. And so we're, we're really trying to evangelize that thought pattern so that people are more mindful about what the data is gonna look like tomorrow because scary thought is that we will all be realistically looking at zettabytes of data, yeah. <laughs> which is really bizarre. Well, at the rate of growth, uh, I think every time you have, you know, Satya Nadella goes and talks, certainly over on the collaboration side, Jeff Teeper talks about this every time he keynotes, you know that the volume of content created, generated in the world in the last month outpaces all the volume of content created before it. Together. Yeah, that's right. I, it's just insane. It's it's we're on a constant hockey stick in the growth of that yeah. content. Yeah, that's a absolutely. that's a lot of photos of people's lunches and their pet cats. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that definitely. Is. That's a lot of memes out there. <laughs> it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of memes, but the the quality of memes I think is going up. So that's good. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that's again AI at work. Yeah. <laughs> truth. That is absolutely true. <laughs> I was actually just had this conversation with a friend where we we're talking about um, trying to find some good memes, 
and said that there should be a library and there should be a co-pilot on top of that library to learn from, to generate, to find the exact memes that we're looking for. You know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, so let me tell you, Alan, also, what kind of, what was your path to becoming an MVP? I mean, a lot of people always like that, that story, the origin story. Uh, I, I mean, I'm assuming as an employee, you were aware of the program and then, but you know, how, what was your path to becoming an MVP from there? Yeah, so, you know, it was really interesting, you know, when I left Microsoft, I, I kind of had my pick of the litter, you know, in the, you know, partner and ISV community. Uh, I wanted to do something a little bit different, a little bit more focused on data, because that's where I grew up. I grew up as a SQL admin, and that was my first language was was SQL. Um, so I kind of wanted to, like, really kind of focus in and, like, really be the data guy for the tail end of my career. So... That's why I chose own company was was because we focus on the data side, but it was it was really kind of um it was there was this point being at Microsoft and being a part of the product team and, and seeing all of the new features a light bulb kind of clicked in my head. Uh, actually, having a conversation with um, you know one of our executive leaders about our our cogs on the product right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when the cost of goods sold is, is increasing, well, you can either increase your price or you can, you can, you know, consume that within your margins and your profitability. And uh, we know Amy Hood won't like that. So <laughs> we, we, we had a lot of discussions around what do we develop in the product. And it was always focused about these new whiz bang things, the sizzle, not the steak. And, uh, and I ended up on a virtual team where we had to develop something for um you know analytics and, and ai and they gave us four months with zero dollars in the budget and that's when my light bulb went on and i said you know what they want the stake for free because they can't monetize it they're, they're not able to monetize these non-functional requirements that people long forgot about when we went to the cloud so after i left microsoft i, I started to you know really kind of evangelize this and talk at the different events and write papers and articles and whatnot and an old friend of mine who was part of the mvp program nominated me and so that nomination came through and here i am in the mvp program continuing to do the same thing really educating the community about the data aspects of uh, what this power platform is looking like and you know, what to expect, how to manage it, what COE looks like, ALM, CICD, all the yeah. acronyms of the world. <laughs> what, what's it, what, what would you say your primary contributions are? What, what, you know, what, what do you enjoy doing? I mean, you, you talk, you kind of named a bunch of different things. What's you have like a passion around this thing, like whether it's a blog or a podcast or things like that. Uh, my passion is actually speaking in front, like at, at the different events. I really enjoy speaking at the events. Um, last summer, we did a circuit where we were talking about, you know, Copilot, you know, in the early days, right? So Copilot being a new, new, uh, new vernacular for the vernacular for the world. And, you know, I had taken some time to really, you know, dissect what people weren't asking about, like responsible AI and how Copilot doesn't have like an undo button. There's no control Z for you know, us old timers that are keyboard bound. Uh, so there's no undo. And so I started to evangelize that because guess what? You can do mundane tasks very quickly and efficiently because the compute power is there, but you can't recover from a mistake. It's all forward rolling and it's all by design. So I wanted to educate the, the people around you know, this generative AI concept and how it's built so that they can understand that in such a way that they can make better decisions, right? And they can architect things better. Um, and I love it because like small companies, large companies, you know, people are coming to me after the sessions and they're like, I never even thought of that before. I didn't know that was a thing. You know, thank you for, you know, opening my eyes to this is not necessarily a risk, but a planning measure for my co-pilot. Yeah. And so, like right now, my big uh, my big thing that I'm like nerding out on right now is um, is the supporting neural networks and the the structure of the neural networks supporting within the overall generative AI space, and helping people understand like the genesis of what a neural network was versus what it is today in 
in this generative AI space. Um, it, it's interesting. And, yeah. and people like, they're like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what's, what's something that's exciting too about this space um, is that there's opportunity in whatever industry you're passionate about. Um, I mean, I, it, it, it's funny, uh, like you're talking before about, uh, you know, lo loving golf. Uh, I had a roommate in college that was a golf major and we all made all the roommates and made fun of him for that. <laughs> and of course, he's the guy who started a golf services business out of college. And we're like, what, what, is, what does that mean? What, what is the golf services? I was like, I don't know, whatever it was, he sold it for multiple millions of dollars to a major golf company yeah. and uh and and so we're like and then continue took a full-time job with that company as well and do it doing very well so um golf services wave of the future people i don't know what it is <laughs> I don't know what that means but any services around golf uh but um but yeah i mean something similar with this i mean you can have passions in different areas but there's data everywhere i've got a a son who finished his degree at the university of utah in atmospheric sciences and I was trying to get him to do a double major and I'm like, I said, you know, you're going to have to do the, the, like the data side of that role, this data scientist role. And it, I said, do a double major. Like, and he's just like, no, no, no. By his junior years where he came back, he said, I really wish I had done that dual major, had that focus. He learned R and Python. He's now has a data science job in that field, still doing governmental things. And now I keep telling him, I said, when you get tired of that salary, you can probably double it on day one by moving over to commercial because yeah. your skills, people that understand that and can mani manipulate the, the, the data. I mean, he does the presentation layer, but I mean, R and Python, he knows the back end, the, the data and to clean that up. I mean, that's, that's a skill. Every industry needs those people. Yeah. Well, and now you look at some of the, the, you know, with the advent of fabric, you know, Microsoft, you know, in my humble opinion, I think they're doing, I think they're so far ahead of the curve in that large data, you know, evangelism and democratization with fabric. Like fabric is the full suite and it impresses me from sunup to sundown. It's incredible. Well, the, the Gartner Quadrants just came out, I think today or yesterday. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so Microsoft is far and away. They're up in the, you know, top right quadrant. Um, the by far yeah. the leader. Yeah, it's amazing to me, and and so like it, it does it. It gives opportunity to the world, to like really kind of dive into these these massive massive architectures of data, and do really cool stuff with them. You know, yeah. Whether it be feeding and feeding an LLM, or whether it be you know doing you know some real time analytics and and you know number crunching, whatever it is, right? So yeah, it's uh. Again, I'm not. I'm not a data scientist. I'm. I'm not an engineer. I'm. I'm a marketer. But uh, you, you know, my my first start software company that I co-founded back in '97. We sold it to Rational Software in 2001. But in '99 and 2000, we partnered with Objectivity. We partnered with IBM. We were doing. We didn't know to call it a social graph, but we built a graph <laughs> and we're doing a bunch of interesting things with it. And, and again, the the companies. Rational bought majority of it. We had a couple other customers that bought pieces of our technology. Um, and it was, a lot of it was about deciphering the complexities, pattern recognition, and those things to be able to go and automate around, you know, the, these activities. It, it was, uh, it's just been a, an exciting space. Oh, yeah. Um, that's why I would say there's, there's no matter what your, your background in. I mean, I always talk about, it. I have a good friend who was a music composition major and yet he became a PM and then a head of engineering at a company has done very well. He found a passion in technology and did very well, even though he didn't have the formal education Training. around that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, but you know, technically my degree is in English literature. <laughs> so I got a degree in English literature, but the, the, the skill they taught me in college was how to consume massive amounts of text, you know, in a very short amount of time. And so I took that to heart and I started reading books and teaching myself programming languages. And it suddenly just kind of all came together when I was sitting there in the old days, copying and pasting functions in my JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just, uh, 
it was a great little evolution of, of being able to use that tool of you know being able to read all those texts and and figure out what to do next where do you think this space is going where's the data space going that's a great question i i think the data space i think we are i think we're ballooning um and i think what's going to happen is rather than deflating like typically you'll see like an inflation and a deflation effect i think what's going to happen is the balloon's going to pop and so if you if you can imagine a balloon popping and you know that that you know that latex kind of going out in multiple directions mm -hmm. i think that's been, what's going to happen is that we're going to balloon out we're going to get into the zettabyte structure and then it's going to burst and then we're going to have like very fine uh, or finer you know relatively speaking um, shards of of extremely clean extremely relevant extremely um, tightly coupled sets of data that will interact nicely with each other uh, if you imagine like all of the, the goodness of like what Informatica is famous what famous for doing right with with like things like data quality management and whatnot like imagine all of those fantastic outputs just everywhere you look yeah right and that's what I kind of foresee happening because AI is is the is the grand arbiter not, not to go too uh, you know Dostoevsky on you but like, <laughs> you know that's the English degree in me sorry <laughs> but uh, you know AI is the grand arbiter and it is the thing that is ultimately going to come in and say we're going to keep our data looking good thanks very much. And, and that's where like RAG and responsible AI and whatever comes next, right? There's going to be a DQM version of that. And um, I, I, I can assure you, we'll get to that point. I think that's too, because of the um, cost and uh, I mean, how much it is to power AI and and the, the predictions on the, its uh, uh, you know consumption as it grows over the years. Um, one thing that you see, I mean, we saw this with, uh, you know, with limited bandwidth, with um, what what it forced then, because you remember even in like the mid to late 90s, as the internet was really starting to explode, you also then had bloatware. We were all used to the spinning clock and, okay, request something. I'm going to walk away, get something to eat, go use the restroom while it's processing, it's downloading or whatever. We got yeah. s a bit spoiled on the high bandwidth. So anytime we have to wait for anything, I mean, just, just go look at your, your website data and where people get impatient, like 3.4 seconds, like, oh, I can't wait for this, you know, <laughs> um, it, it's, it, but what having those constraints does is it forces you to go back and look at how can we more efficiently provide, answer the actual need, get rid, cut out the bloat. Um, so I, I think that even in the solutions we're looking at today and how responsive it is, it's needed for the cloud that they're going to be able to do things locally um, that will give a uh, you know e even a, a streamlined or unified experience with the the cloud um, so that you're doing things where it's locally where it's performing where it, it can process faster and do those things locally the things out there it's just going to be smarter applications smarter systems and solutions out there with more focused maybe it's ability to go instead of like going and having to create you know the data mart system and build each of those and do the joins and pull in all the information and then sequester that off in a different system and let the users hit that that it dynamically finds out what you yeah. need and builds the mart in there dynamically for the in the moment that you need it and shuffles things around but the, i mean yeah, well, there's yeah gonna be breakthroughs we're already starting to see, like, again, going back into Fabric, right? Fabric and, and even Purview to some extent from what I've seen has the ability to monitor uh, metadata structures, right? And this is the thing that I try to educate people on is like, we think of data as like rows and rows and tables or folder structures, um, you know, drives and disks, but it's not just the raw data. That's raw data, great, whoop to do. But there's also metadata. And beyond metadata, there's this third factor that nobody has really kind of consumed and like brought into the game. It's sitting on the fence waiting to get picked, which is telemetry data. 
So you take these three pieces and you fold them together, and now you've got a three-dimensional model of what the heck is going on. It's really compelling when you look at how telemetry can give structure to data and metadata. Certainly. I mean, what's actually being, I mean, that's why usage metrics and going and really understanding, I mean, that's a key part of it. It's not just about the, the data, so the, the demographic, you know, the, the core data about that, the psychographic around the, the user, all the other profile information is then actually looking at, this goes back to those, those patterns. What are people actually using? What are they actually doing within that? Where are they clicking? You know, how long between each of those clicks and like whatever that data is for that, that, that system. And then building higher performing functions, removing features and capabilities that are never used, uh, you know, and, and you're constantly optimizing. It just makes me, uh, you know, think of, uh, again, I'm a Deming fan is that, you know, his, uh, and if you, if you know, W Ed Edwards Deming, I can hear his voice yeah. in my head where he <laughs> utters the phrase, you know, optimize the system. It's, that's the secret. You're constantly optimizing. You're constantly adjusting that based on those data points. And that's where we're going to see it's uh, once in a while, it's great to see this explosion and this fantastic, this thing that we've never seen or heard of before. Most of this technology that's around us has been incremental. It snuck up on us because we stopped watching it, like yeah. you're watching water boil. Um, but it's an incremental change rather than an in, in instant miraculous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and before you know it, like, you know, we have this, uh, you know, there's this pervasiveness with, you know, Copilot and generative AI and chat GPT. Like this is now a household, you know, mentality. And it won't be long before, you know, quantum compute and the, and the you know, the underpinnings of, of quantum computing will be at the same level. And when those two merge, God help us all. <laughs> yeah. I just, there was just something that was in the news or, or it was being discussed on a, a podcast. I don't even remember now because I'm constantly consuming information, but was talking about the, um, like the bio chips or whatever. So like it's, it's a, it's basically, it's the, you know, it, it's a microscopic, it's, it's, it's using living cells and as processors and it, what it's, it's able to compute it like a million times the speed of, you know, the most powerful computers, like all these kinds of things. It's like, yeah, as soon as they harness that thing, yeah, and then we'll start getting the Johnny mnemonic, you know, the plugs in the back of the head, <laughs> the matrix like, be able to learn things, and you know, suddenly everybody knows karate, and <laughs> that'll be just in time for me to like reach my senility. So I'm I'm yeah. all right with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, won't remember your name, but you'll know karate. So <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. that's that's the future that I envision as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Alan, really appreciate your time and great meeting you. Enjoy that. Uh, we're only up to like 97 degrees today. I don't know what it's, what's going on down there for you, but yeah, yeah. We're low one hundreds today. So yeah. it's, it's a cool walk in the park. Yeah. It's not that bad. And it's a dry heat. So, so yeah. everybody West of, uh, of, uh, of, of Texas. So we just, we can say that and it's a legit thing. If you've yeah. never experienced the dry heat versus the humidity, oh, there's a world of difference. <laughs> but growing up like i i did in sacramento valley in the middle of summer in august i when i was 18 i was doing roofing oh boy so yeah. I, it's another 20 degrees up on top of a roof of a house of um, whatever yeah. it is outside so yeah i think i, I paid my dues that summer for hot <laughs> weather. so but alan it's great connecting with you for folks that want to find you reach out to you where are you most active in social where can people find you LinkedIn, purely a LinkedIn guy. Okay. We'll have all that information, of course, out on the blog and out on YouTube. So you'll be able to find the information, so reach out and talk with Alan, ask about his role, ask about Sacramento weather, whatever you want to talk <laughs> about, reach out to him. But thanks a lot, Alan, for your time. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for having me.